Okay. Not just tonight. All right. Michael called me today. <clears throat> He's not feeling good. He told me he wouldn't be able to make it tonight. Want to know if I'd take class, and so I'm going to do Michael's lesson. Now, there's a man in the Bible that's a womanizer. He's a brawler. He's egotistic. He takes vengeance on those that do him wrong. Yet he is a warrior of God that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as among the faithful. The children of Israel had done evil in the sight of God and God put them under the rule of the Philistines for 40 years. In Judges chapter 13 and verse 1, it says that the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. All right, so they're going to be there. There was a child though that was born into Israel that would begin to lead them out from under the rule of the Philistines, and that's chapter thirteen, verse five. It says, "For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son." And no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. In other words, he's not going to accomplish it. But he's going to begin to do that. Alright, we will notice that in this verse, that he would be a Nazarite. Whenever you look in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, we see the requirements there for a Nazarite. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either a man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister. When they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. And in verse 8, all the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. So those are the requirements of a Nazarite. Whenever we look in chapter 13, verse 5, they're not all mentioned. Judges 13, 5. Again, thou shalt conceive, bear a son, no razor shall come on his head. That was one of them that was mentioned in Numbers. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now we back up to verse 4, and we see here the angel is talking to Manoah's wife. And he says, I pray thee, drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Of course, that was a command in Israel anyway to not eat of any unclean thing, but apparently that's something that hadn't been obeyed a lot because he had to tell her to do that. Well, notice the one that was not mentioned here in this Nazarite was the requirement that not coming near a bed, uh, dead body. That requirement is not mentioned here in, in Judges chapter 13, verse 5. And those three requirements were given for the mother and the son. No eat no unclean, drink, you know, nothing to do with the grape or the grape of any kind, no razor on the head. In chapter thirteen, verse twenty four, we see the name of this child that was born. Verse twenty four says, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And then verse 25 says, The Spirit of the Lord began more to more 
to move, I'll get my glasses straight here, to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorba and Eshtael. All right, I want to look at Samson's exploits now. And that begins in chapter 14. The first thing that Samson did was choose a wife from a nation that he shouldn't have chosen a wife from. In verses 1 through 4, it says, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? <clears throat> and Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. You know, you could go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and begin reading there in verse 1, and there are several nations there that they were not to marry into. The Philistines is not, or are not named there. The Philistine nation is not named there. But you go to Exodus chapter 34, and you look at verses 11 through 16. Exodus 34, 11 to 16. <clears throat> it says, Observe thou, that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed unto thee thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. And of course, the Philistine nation would have been in that land. In verse 13 it says, You shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go whoring after their gods, do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. And their daughters go whoring after their gods and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Right there, they were not to marry into the land, the people from the land. Now the question arises, is did Samson have a choice then? Because it said it was of the Lord. You look at some commentators, they say Samson didn't have a choice because God planned it that way. But has God always given mankind a choice in the decisions that we make? Yes, He has. So whenever you look at that, Samson had a choice in the matter, and when he made his choice, God providentially acted to fulfill or to bring about the destruction of the Philistines. You know, God can take bad actions and turn them into accomplishing His will. You think about the brothers of Joseph selling him into you know, Egyptian slavery. That was a bad action on their part, but God used that to save a nation. So this was a bad action on Samson's part, but God used that to bring about the destruction of the Philistines. Now, she's the one that he wanted to marry, and I'm not going to take the time to read verses 5 through 13, but that's just where Samson had gone down and he killed a lion, and I always found it kind of interesting whenever he killed that lion. It says they ripped him up like he would a kid. You know, kid of a goat or something. It's going to be kind of hard. I can't imagine going out and tearing a goat apart. That just don't sound that easy to me. But it would have been apparently for Samson. But he killed the lion. He went back to prepare for the wedding. He came back by. You know, the bees had made the hive in there. And there was honey in it. And then whenever he got down to where he was going to get married at, he hadn't brought any friends, so they gave him 30 companions to be the friends of the groom there while he was there. And he set forth that riddle to them there down in verse 12 and following on down about the sweet coming out of the eater and things such as that. But we'll drop down to verse 15. It says, And it came to pass on the seventh day, now, a little more background. He said, if you can tell me 
Judges 14, 15, sorry. Judges 14, 15. It says on the seventh day, all right, Samson gave these guys seven days to figure out his riddle. And if they didn't figure out his riddle, they were to give him 30 pieces of clothing, the outer garment and the inner garment. But if they figured out his riddle, then he would give them 30 pieces of garments the same kind. All right. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, and these are those thirty companions, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called to us to take what we have? Is it not so? Alright, so right there, they're, they're telling her, you find out the answer to that riddle, you tell us or you're going to die. You and your father are going to die. Well, verse 16 says, Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not, that put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father or my mother, and shall I tell it thee? Verse 17, She wept before him the seven days while the feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her. Because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. Alright, so we see on the seventh day, these companions came and told her, we're going to kill you if you don't tell us the answer to the riddle. But she had already been weeping before him all these seven days, so apparently she wanted to know it too. Even before they came. But whenever they came, now she has more of a reason to learn the riddle. The answer to the riddle. So she had been doing this all that time. And we'll notice several times in this lesson that the strong man is very weak in some ways. Very weak because he told her the riddle. Well, after he told her the riddle, they told, you know, the companions told him the answer to that. So Samson went down and he got some revenge. You know, he was, he was doing God's will in doing this. In verse 19, it says of chapter 14, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went to Ashkelon and slew thirty men of them, took their spoil, gave the change of garments unto them that expounded the riddle. Then it says, And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. Alright, who was his anger kindled against? One of them would be this fiance, we'll call her. Because she got the riddle out of him. One of them would probably be the Philistines because they did what they were, you know, what they did to get the riddle out of her as well. And in verse 20, it says Samson's wife was given to his companion. Probably the fellow that would have been his best man. So he, the father gave, you know, his, his wife to him. All right. Well, in chapter 15 now, <clears throat> Samson's going to get revenge. Verse 1, it came to pass a while after the time of wheat harvest, this is in the spring, that Samson visited his wife with a kid and he said, I'll go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. The father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her, Therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Alright? It's a very odd story, you know, whenever you're looking at all this. Take her younger sister. Well, Samson said in verse 3, I'm going to be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. He's going to be blameless to them because of the things that they had already done. It says in verse 4, He went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst of two tails. Alright, think about trying to catch 300 foxes. That's going to be fun, isn't it? And then think about trying to put fire on all of their tails after you tied them all together. That's going to be something to accomplish, wouldn't it? But anyway... <clears throat> Verse 5 says, When he set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burned up both the shops and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Alright, we're in the wheat harvest, so that's the shocks of the wheat. Uh, corn here in the King James Version a lot of time refers to wheat 
instead of the corn that we think about. So in other words, he burnt their harvest up. He burnt their vineyards up. And he burnt their orchards up with these foxes. So he got revenge on them for what they had done. All right, verse 6 says, Then the Philistines said, Who had done this? They answered, Samson, son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. So, even though she answered, you know, got the answer to the riddle earlier, they went ahead and burned him with fire anyway. So you see what kind of people the Philistines were because of that. All right, now we come to verses 7 and 8 of chapter 15. It says, Samson said unto them, Though you have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. Verse 8 says, He smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Etum. All right, you look at hip and thigh there, it just basically means he whooped them good. And he went to live in... Etum, that rock, and that mean, word Etum means hawk ground. So I guess the hawks live there. So it would be a high spot, but also later on we'll see it's also a low spot. Anyway, in verses 9 through 17, Samson killed a thousand Philistines. The Philistines went up and pitched in Judah, so now we know where the rock Etum was. It was in Judah somewhere. They really don't know. And spread themselves in Lehi, another place where they really don't know is. Verse 10, And the men of Judah said, Why are you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he had done to us. Verse 11 says, Then three thousand men of Judah went to the top of the rock Edom, and, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they have did unto me, so have I done unto them. Alright, so he's now at, at Lehi, which means jaw. And what just happened here? What just happened? The enemies had come up to, of the Lord's people, had come to the people there in Judah, and the people in Judah had compromised. They compromised, they'd gone up now 3,000 of them to get Samson because they had compromised at this time. One writer, you think about the way they were Treating, you know, 3,000 of them went up to get Samson. One writer said the men of Judah respected Samson the same reason we respect a tornado. And that's the, what respect they had. But then we see God's people siding with the enemy. And yet today, though, how many people will apologize to others whenever the truth is spoken? But anyway, we continue reading here <clears throat> chapter 15. Verse 12 says, They said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. Did he trust them? No, they didn't trust them. If they were going to compromise and, and fall over to the side of the enemy, why should he trust them? But then again, he was kind of like that tornado. They had respect for him. But you'll notice also, verse 13, they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. So verse 12 says we are come down. And verse 13 says they went up. Well, Samson was in a cave. He was dwelling in a cave at that point. But then the sad part there is that they, they sided against him. Now verse 14. And when it came to Lehi, again the word Lehi means jaw, the Philistines shouted against him. The word shout there means basically to shout for joy. They were happy that they had captured him. 
And it says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And one writer said, Can you imagine what the eyes of the Philistines looked like when those bands popped off? Verse 15 says, He found a new jawbone of a donkey, put forth his hand, took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. Alright? Again, as one writer put it, that jawbone would have been powerless without the Spirit of the Lord behind every blow. But he killed a thousand men with that jawbone. Alright? Verse 16 though, so Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. What did Samson do wrong there? He said, I. He didn't give God the credit, did he? But you know, God has a way of humbling his servants. There beginning in verse 18. It says, and he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. You know, we only have two prayers of Samson recorded, one now and one later. You know, well, why wouldn't Samson... Well, look at the life of Samson. We'll see why. Verse 19 says, But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived, whereof he called the name thereof in Hakare, which is in Lehi unto this day. And again, remember that the name Lehi means jaw. So it was in Lehi. It was not in the jaw that, you know, the jawbone that Samson threw away. And then the name that the place that he called in Hakare. In Hakare means spring of one calling. And it says he dwelt in, where was it? Lehi. There it is, verse 17. Ramoth Lehi. That word is the height of a jaw. All right, so verse 20 says he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. You remember a while ago that it said that they were going to be under the Philistine rule for 40 years. That's why it said Samson began to deliver them. Now we come down to chapter 16. We see the lifestyle of Samson. He goes to a harlot. Verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. Well, what did he do? He committed fornication. You know, this is really a godly type person, isn't it? Really a godly man. Verse 2 said, the, told the Gazite, saying, Samson has come hither. They compassed him in, laid wait all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Verse 3 says, Samson laid on midnight, and arose at midnight, took the doors of the, great, or the gate of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Heber. I don't know how big the gates of the city were, but they had to be pretty big. And he took the whole thing and carried it from what I was able to find out about 38 miles to the top of a hill. All right, verse 4. Now we're going to come to Samson met his match. Came to pass afterward, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Delilah means feeble, tender, and delicate. Can names be misleading? They can be, can't they? Well, as we read through this, apparently Samson and Delilah were shacking up, I guess you would say. They were living in sin. But anyway, verse 5 says, The lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him. And we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Now if these were the five lords of the Philistines that are mentioned earlier, what they would have given offered her was about 150 pounds of silver. And at the price I looked up today, that would be worth $35,131 and a quarter. 
So Samson had a pretty good price on his head. But as one writer wrote, you just can't warn some people. Just can't warn them. Verse 6, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Well, Samson said, If thou bind me with seven green widths, that's binds, that were never dried, then shall I be weak as any other, as another man. Now, shouldn't a red flag have popped up there in the mind of Samson? Well, verse 8 says, The Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven green vines, or seven green wisps, which had not been dried. She bound him with them. There were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the wisps as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire, so his strength was not known. All right, verse 10, Delilah said to him, Samson, behold, thou hast mocked me. Had he mocked her? Yeah, he had. And told me lies. Had he lied? Yeah, he had. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, or fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, verse 11, he said, They buy me fast and new ropes that were never occupied. Then I shall be weak as any other man. So guess what Delilah did? She took new ropes, bound him therewith. Said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. There were liars in wait, waiting in the chamber, and he broke them from off his arms like a thread. Now the third time, Delilah said to Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. All right, now come on, Samson. It's time to wake up. You know, time to wake up, see what's going on here. Well, he said, if thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the whip, then it would be. You know, he must have had seven locks. I don't know how long his hair would have been, but you know, just get them in there and weave them together. I'll be weak. Well, verse 14 says, She fastened it with the pen, said to him, The Philistines be upon thee. He waked out of his sleep, went away with the pen and his beam in the well. He had walked off with everything again. All that hanging from his head. You know what Samson's problem was? He had two problems. Number one, he was more concerned with girls than he was with God. Number two, he was overconfident. He probably thought he would never be unable to defeat the Philistines. Well, they finally, she finally found out, and I know Darren's going to give me here the time's up here in a minute. Oh, he told me the time's up now? Oh, okay. Do you mind if I go a little longer? <laughs> He told her what to do. Cut the hair off his head. And she knew that was the truth. And when that happened, what happened to Samson? Verse 21, The Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to gaze about him in fetters of brass, and he ground in the prison house. Samson was probably better off blind than he was seen. What had led him astray? The lust of the eyes. Lost the eyes that led him astray. But now that he was blind, he could focus more on God. Samson is the perfect example of Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But then we'll see that his hair began to grow again. And down in verse 22, his hair began to grow after it was shaven. They got a great feast together. For Dagon, their god, Dagon was a fish god. The first or the upper half of its body was human. The lower half of its body was fish. So that was what they worshipped. They went into the house of Dagon there. And Samson, I believe there was what, 10,000 people there? I don't remember now. I think it was 3,000 people on the roof. That would have been the common people. All the nobles and all the upper class people would have been inside the building. Verse 27 says, The house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there was upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. You know, they were treating, you know, go, make, go play for us, Samson. You're blind and all that. Verse 28, we have the second recorded prayer of Samson. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may 
be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And that's when we got the two main pillars there of that building and pushed them apart and the whole thing came crashing down. And it says there in verse 30, it says, The house fell upon the lords, upon all the people that were therein, so the dead which he slew in his death were more than they which he slew in his life. All right, whenever we look at Samson, though, he's called faithful. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. <clears throat> It says, What more shall I say? For the time had failed me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson. Samson, verse 3 tells us that, or excuse me, which verse was I looking at? Yeah, verse 3, through faith, back to verse 2, received a good report. Samson's life, and I'll go ahead and comment. Samson's life is a good example of how an individual can waste an entire life. How much good could he have done if he had been faithful to God that whole time? Anyway, anybody got any comments? There's no comments. There's one verse that's interesting here that I didn't really mention. Judges 16, 28. All three names of God are mentioned there. 16.28 Samson called unto the Lord right there, that's Jehovah the self-existent one and said, O Lord God the word Lord there is Adonai which means my Lord or my ruler the word God there is Jehovah which is just the Jehovah it's used with God and that's the Lord God and he says, I pray thee, strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God. That's Elohim. That's the plural name of God. So all three names of God were used there in the prayer of Samson. All right. Surely somebody has something about Ah, Joshua. Joshua's the runner. Well, the first one that holds his hands up is always the runner. It's on. Yeah. Would that be considered suicide, though? That, he didn't actually, well, he was killing his enemies. You know, would it be considered suicide to fall on a grenade to save someone else? Probably not. So, no, that wouldn't have been considered suicide. Anybody else? Just stand up. You know, I'm sure I can start pointing and you know, make people speak. I'm <laughs> Bob had his hand up. I saw him. Oh, he was just scratching. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I don't guess you have to be on the air to say it. Delilah. Yeah, you you think about it. He three times she tried to get him captured, and he never did learn any better. You, you think he might? He was a lot stronger in the arms than he was in the head. Free will. She said it's called free will. <laughs> All right. Josh, they're not going to work you. I mean, Gary needs to say something, and then Bob, and then Jeff, and then Bradley. You know. All right. Well, if y'all don't have anything else, that's all I've got on Samson, but. That's, that's quite a life. And you look at his life, though. It's kind of like in the New Testament. Thank God for Peter. Well, thank God for Samson, too. Because we can see that no matter how evil of a life an individual may live, they can always repent. Uh, I wish that I had known you were going to teach this class tonight because Michelle and I have been to this archaeological dig on the Soros Valley in Meshach. Okay. Okay. And you look down to the left down the valley, and that's towards Ekron and Timna. Okay. And I've got a panoramic that shows the whole Sorek Valley and from the dig site. 
Okay. And it's kind of neat to stand there and realize that, that Samson, you know, did a lot of his. Yeah. He did yeah. Within the view of, of uh, Beth Shemesh. You know, right. The Ark of the Covenant was eventually brought back after the Philistines stole it. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I would have I would have given you some neat pictures to, yeah. to throw up. Yeah, it would have been. Doug has something. That's all it's starting now. I was just going to ask on the, the 300 foxes, um, is that, um, is that an, or do you know, is that an animal like we would know as a fox today? Some said it might be like a jackal, yeah, be a fox or a jackal. Here in Israel, it's, it's about the size of a large fox, and they think that that probably could be the type of animal, Okay. according to Dale Manor. Go over with from Harding University. He's a professor of archaeology and Bible. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a nocturnal animal. You usually don't get to see it except at night. And we caught a glimpse of one one night when we were driving through the winding area going towards Jerusalem. We kind of caught view of one, and yeah. we didn't get to really see it too much. But it's it's kind of a, a large, what you might call a large fox, you know. It has okay. a pretty big bushy tail on it. Yeah. Now, if that's exactly what Samson caught, who knows? Right. right. But that is a type of animal that lives over there. Okay. You know. Yeah, because there were lions there then too. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's not now. So. Right. Okay. All right. Well, Darren's getting ready to ring the bell, so I guess we can shut it down. Right.